that had distanced himself from that, from the manifestations of the shirk that was present uh, in and among the jazeera, uh, is uh, manifestations one of, of shirk related to the adat and their customs. Al halif, mathalan, bil aba, swearing by their fathers. As far as swearing by their fathers is concerned, then it was common among them. Or swearing, ikhwan, by Allah and Ar-Rahim. Swearing by Allah and the womb. Not only did they used to swear by their fathers, but they would swear by Allah and the womb. And so they would say, Anshaduka billahi wa rahim That they would take an oath by Allah and the womb. And some of the scholars of tafsir mention that this oath that they used to take by, the, uh, by Allah Azza wa Jalla and the womb is that which Allah Azza wa Jalla has mentioned as occurs in the statement of Allah Azza wa Jalla وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ وَالْأَرْحَامِ إِنَّ اللَّهَ كَانَ عَلَيْكُمْ أَقِيبًا Allah Azza wa Jalla mentions fear Allah, the one whom وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ الَّذِي تَسَاءَلُونَ بِهِ the one who you seek your needs from or the one who you ask of wal arham and al arham from the scholars of tafsir are those who say why did allah azza wa jal mention the arham here from them are those who hold that it is a reference to being mindful concerning your arham being mindful concerning the wombs and fearing allah as it relates to them that is fearing allah as it relates to your mothers your grandmothers your women folk well from them are those who held that the ayah is a reference to fearing Allah Azza wa Jal, the one who you ask for your mutual rights from and the womb who you used to swear by likewise or the like of which you used to swear by. So Allah Azza wa Jal, uh, in that verse on the basis of the position that was held by some of the scholars of tafsir uh, they uh, mentioned that Allah Azza wa Jal highlighted to them the fact that they would swear by the womb and that was a reminder of the fact that they would do so. And so they should fear Allah Azza wa Jalla in regards to their oaths and in regards to the wombs that they used to swear by. Uh, and that then was from the manifestations of the affairs of shirk. Among them was the usage of the tamaim, that is, they would use uh, uh, the tamima and hold and yani, connect them to themselves, to their children. Uh, and they would wear talismans that would, or that they believed would protect them. And that, that of course, Ikhwan is from the manifestations of shirk. They would perform ruqya, but their ruqya was done with the hayya and with the aqrab. That is, they would perform ruqya with snakes. And they would perform ruqya with scorpions. And from them were cases of individuals who would die, pass away because they were bitten by those snakes that were used for uh, the ruqya. <laughs> so the individual comes along to try and cure him, he ends up killing him. And those, that was from the manifestations of jahiliya. Similarly, from their manifestations is that they would swear by the malaika and they would claim that the malaika, they were the daughters of Allah Azza wa Jal. And so Allah Azza wa Jal dispraised them for this claim. أَفَأَصْفَاكُمْ رَبُّكُمْ بِالْبَنِينَ وَاتَّخَذَ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنَاثًا Did Allah Azza wa Jal, or did Allah choose for you sons? But you choose for Allah Azza wa Jal inatha? Yani you choose for Allah daughters? And that is, that it wasn't that Allah Azza wa Jal was dispraising daughters, but that you choose for yourselves and praise yourselves on the basis of having sons. But then you attribute to Allah Azza wa Jal daughters, that which you wouldn't even attribute to yourself. And that is, to, that is not to say in any way that Allah Azza wa Jal attributes to himself any sons. But how is it that you people judge? Similarly, Ikhwan, from the manifestations of, of their jahiliya, uh, is that they used to make the jinn shuraka, that is, they would consider the jinn partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and them considering the jinn shuraka is either that they would seek refuge in the jinn or that they saw and held that the 
jinn uh, were partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala just as the other mushrikun when they would worship their idols they saw that those idols were partners with Allah subhanahu and Allah azza wa jal has made the affair clear وَجَعَلُوا بَيْنَهُ وَبَيْنَ الْجِنَّةِ نَسَبَ that Allah azza wa jal mentions as occurs in surah, surah Safat that they make between him and the jinn lineage and a relation وَلَقَدْ عَلِمَتِ الْجِنَّةُ أَنَّهُمْ مُحْضَرُونَ إِنَّهُمْ لَمُحْضَرُونَ but indeed the jinn knew that they were, were to be gathered before Allah Azza wa Jal. And the jinn themselves knew that they were to stand before Allah Azza wa Jal to give an account. But you human beings or individuals uh, uh, making or liking, likening them uh, and making partners with the jinn and Allah Azza wa Jal. Similarly, they would seek refuge in the jinn. They would enter into particular valleys and they would ask the sahib and the companion of that valley to protect them. And so they would call upon the jinn of the valley in order to protect them. But that would only increase them, ikhwan, in weakness, in sharr, in evil, and in sin. As Allah Azza wa Jal informs us, وَأَنَّهُ كَانَ رِجَالٌ مِنَ الْإِنسِ يَعُودُونَ بِرِجَالٍ مِنَ الْجِنِّ فَزَادُوهُمْ رَحَقًا That indeed a group from among the ins, from among mankind, they sought refuge in a group from among the jinn and they only increased them in sin. Uh, and so the affair of the bond between the human beings and the jinn, calling upon them, utilizing them, was something well known, ikhwan, among them. In fact, from the, uh, from the sahaba and from the companions of the messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, there were those uh, who were well known for having this companionship and having this relation between themselves and the jinn. From them, the likes of Abu Barzata al-Aslami, radiyallahu anhu. Abu ba Barzata, he was a kahin in Jahiliyyah. He was a soothsayer in Jahiliyyah and would c communicate with the jinn. And the Yahud of Medina would utilize him regularly. They would call upon him to, disp to deal with their disputes uh, and they would utilize his ability to communicate with the jinn uh, and uh, to uh, ascertain that which would happen, to ascertain that which was connected to their battles and what have you. But when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was sent, he embraced. Likewise, Ikhwan, from those who were well known for communicating with the jinn, we have the likes of Sawad ibn Qarib, al dawsi Sawad ibn Qarib, who was Yemeni in his origin, uh, he was from among them who, and from among the people of Jahiliyyah, who were well known for communicating with the jinn, but he was a kahin. Uh, and there was an a, a, a instance that occurs in Sahih Bukhari that Umar radiallahu anhu on an occasion he saw, he saw him walking before him and he was a beautiful man. He saw him walking before him and the farasa and the ajib nature of Umar was that he had the ability to look upon individuals and sense certain things. And so he looked upon him and he said that indeed, I am certain this man used to be a kahin in Jahiliyyah or a kahin in the past. Though he knew he was a Muslim. And so he called upon him uh, and he was amazed at the fact that he had ascertained and recognized that. And then he went on to explain his story. And he mentioned the fact that it was no one from the human beings who gave me da'wah. No human being approached me in order to call me to Allah Azza wa Jal. And the narration is in Sahih Bukhari and in the Sunan Al-Kubra of Imam Al-Bayhaqi. No individual from among the humans gave me da'wah. He said, in fact, it was an individual and a companion that I had from among the jinn. And he went on to explain the fact that when the messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was sent as a messenger, something occurred within the world of the jinn. And that is that they used to, as occurs in those authentic narrations, they would climb one on top of the other until they elevated into the heavens and ascended into the skies. Uh, and they would listen and steal a listen of that which was taking place within the heavens. But on an occasion, with, after the sending of the Messenger wasallam, they would attempt to penetrate the skies, but they found that every time they tried to do so, that they would be pelted. And so one of the 
the leaders from among them said it is on the basis of something that has happened in the earth so send individuals to search and to see what it is has taken place and so they sent individuals who would scour the earth looking for what had taken place and they came across the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam with his companions praying fajr and so they reported back to their kubara and they said indeed it is because of this when they went back to their their elders and their leaders they said indeed it is because of this and so the jinn of sawad he came to him and he said that indeed there has occurred and appeared in mecca a prophet and a messenger and it will be greatly beneficial to you if you were to go and you were to follow him for indeed he is the prophet that the Yehud and that the Jews have known of his coming. And so he mentioned there was no one from the human beings that gave me da'wah. Rather, it was an individual from among the jinn. And so from them, Ikhwan, there were those who were kuhan. Yani those who were soothsayers and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guided them to Islam and to the sunnah. Likewise, ayuhal ikhwa, it was well known in and among the uh, a people of Quraysh in Mecca and in the Jazeera generally that they were a people of Sha'ar. From, if we were to look at the, their society from a point of view of arts and culture, then the arts and culture and its manifestation in and among their ranks and at their time was Sha'ar, was Arabic poetry. And there is no doubt, Ikhwan, that they excelled in the most eloquent and the most beautiful of speech that human beings could put together. And that, no doubt, Ikhwan, is uh, from the affairs that caused them to be affected by the book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. From the, uh, from the sh shu'ara and from those who were well known for shi'ar, there were seven poets who were well known, Ikhwan, in and among the ranks of the Arab to have excelled in shi'ar to the extent that their poems were stuck upon the walls of the Kaaba and known as the Mu'allaqat as sabah or the seven poems that were stuck on the walls of the Kaaba. Uh, and so, Ikhwan, the, uh, the shi'r and the poetry that was present among the Arab, uh, it was well known, Ikhwan, that they had excelled in terms of eloquence uh, and uh, it uh, was, as we mentioned, uh, it reached the level that we had seven of the uh, best, most eloquent poems stuck up on the wall of the Kaaba, the walls of the Kaaba, Ikhwan, because of that which they had reached from eloquence. Uh, and there were numerous poets uh, who had uh, uh, their poems placed upon the Kaaba. Uh, the likes, Ikhwan of Ubaid al Aslami, the likes of uh, Amr ibn Kulthum, uh, Labid and others from among the well-known shu'ara of the Arab, uh, who would have those uh, stanzas placed around the Kaaba. And it was for that reason that they were amazed, ikhwan, and were affected by the Qur'an. When, when Allah Azza wa Jal revealed the Qur'an to his messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa and he began to recite among them with that which they could not explain. And as we've mentioned previously, ikhwan, the uh, poetry of the Arab, it usually fell upon uh, certain what are known as abhur or uncertain yani, syllable forms uh, that those syllable forms you, you found that the poetry of the Arab never left those syllable forms they were upon certain forms and structures al-bahr al-tawil al-bahr al-qasir and the various different forms that those lines of poetry fell upon so when they heard the Quran and they uh, listened to its eloquence and its powerful statements and its balagha and the, the manner in which it excelled in uh, uh, Arabic eloquence, they were unable to explain it because it didn't fall upon any of those stanzas or any of those forms. And so they couldn't refer to it as poetry because it didn't fall on any of the well-known forms and structures of poetry. And it came from an individual, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who was not known to be a poet among them. 
neither was he known except to be upright and amin and the best from among the best of them a man who never lied against an individual lied upon anyone why then would he lie upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and so it amazed them and they could not explain it and thus the manner in which they would warn against it is that they would say that it is magic don't listen to it if, it, if you listen to it it is going to affect you because they were amazed at its beauty uh, and if ikhwan we had just the khutbatul haja alone causing that the guidance of the people and people to be affected by it so because in the hadith in Sahih al-Bukhari, uh, Sahih Muslim, uh, the hadith of Jabir ibn Abdullah that on an occasion, one of the uh, people who are well known for Ruqya, the Mahdi ibn Tha'labat al-Azdi, that he heard the uh, 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 notables of Quraysh saying that Muhammad is majnoon, Muhammad is deranged, that Muhammad is, uh, he has a jinn, that he is one that is uh, affected by magic. And so, Dhamad ibn Tha'laba was known in Jahiliyyah to perform ruqya. And so he said that indeed, I am going to offer my skills to the Prophet wasallam. And so he came across the Messenger wasallam on an occasion, and he said, Oh Muhammad, do you not see that I should cure you of this jinn and this junoon that I hear the people accusing you of? And so the Prophet wasallam, when he heard him make that statement, he turned to him and said, Inna alhamdulillah Nahmaduhu wa nasta'inuhu wa nasta'gfiru Wa na'udhu billahi min shuroori anfusina Wa sayyati amalina Ma yahdihi allahu fala mudillala Wa man yudhilil fala hadiya lah Wa ashadu an la ilaha inna allah Wahdahu la sharika lah Wa ashadu anna muhammadan abduhu wa rasooluh And so Dhamad he said ya O Muhammad Indeed I have heard the words of magicians and soothsayers and I've heard the words of poets, but never have I heard the likes of that which you have just said to me. Repeat it to me. And the Prophet ﷺ repeated it three times. And the uh, 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 thereon after, he said, give me your hand and let me pledge allegiance to you to Islam. So he entered Islam, Ikhwan, on the basis of hearing the khutbatul haja. And of course, the Quran, Ikhwan, was the, is the kalam of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And so when they would hear the Qur'an being recited, they were unable to explain it. They couldn't refer to it as poetry because it didn't fall on the normal forms of poetry. They couldn't refer to it as the statements of soothsayers because it called to Allah. And its message was strong. And so the only thing that they could do was warn the people against it uh, and... Uh, uh, inform them that they should not listen to it. And so the Mujtama Ikhwan and the uh, uh, society of the pre-Islamic Arab was one that was filled with sharr. As far as the woman is concerned, for hadith wala haraj. As far as the woman is concerned, Ikhwan, then narrate concerning her, and indeed you will be amazed concerning some of the itiqadat and the beliefs that they uh, uh, had concerning the woman. From them is that they used to hold, of course, Ikhwan, that the woman, she was not a part, in essence, uh, she was not a legitimate part of their qabila. That they used to hold that the qabila or the tribe was that which was constructed of the men. The men from among their tribe, they were, in essence, the qabila. And the women, they used to look upon them as a source of weakness for the tribe. Since the man, is the one that participates in battles. He is the one that goes on to have sons that will continue the lineage of the tribe and so on. And so the woman was seen as something that weakened the tribe. And that is when the practice of why the practice of wa'adul banat began to become manifest. And that is that they would, they would bury the females that they would have, the daughters that they would have, they would bury them alive. And that is just to remove themselves of them and of the shame of having a child that would weaken their family, weaken their qabila, weaken the tribe as far as they were concerned. And so Allah Azza wa Jal dispraises their practice in numerous places in the Quran. Similarly, Ikhwan, from their belief as it relates to uh, the woman, 
uh, is that they would hold that the woman, uh, and if it was, of course, the, uh, the women and the wives of one's fathers, that one would inherit them. And so Allah Azza wa Jal had prohibited the practice in the Quran. لا يحل لكم أن ترثوا النساء قرها. Allah Azza wa Jal mentioned, it is not halal for you to inherit the women قرها. يعني that is outside of or يعني without their uh, 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 consent and without their agreement and their good pleasure. That is, they were coerced. Uh, and what would happen or how that would manifest is that a man, uh, if his father would pass away, then he would inherit his house, he would inher inherit his cattle, his land, his property, and he would inherit his wife. And that, of course, is the wife that was other than his mother. Uh, and so he would, if a man had numerous wives, which was usually the case, if they were men of wealth and opulence and uh, no uh, nobility and uh, notables, then they would have more than one wife. When their father would pass away, then they would inherit the wife of their father. And the inheritance of the wife of their father would manifest uh, in uh, uh, a number of ways. Either when they would inherit their wife, the wife of their father, either they would marry them. And so it was one's father's wife, but now it is my wife. And so they would marry the wives of their fathers. And Allah Azza wa Jal prohibited that practice. Allah Azza wa Jal mentions, وَلَا تَنْكِحُوا مَا نَكَحَ آبَاؤُكُمْ مِنَ النِّسَاءِ إِلَّا مَا قَدْ سَلَفْ Do not marry the women that your fathers have married except that which has passed. So Allah Azza wa Jal made that practice haram. Or secondly, that they uh, would marry their wives, any their father's wives, to individuals that desired to marry them for a steep price and they would keep the mahar. And so the wife then of their fathers became like an object that they would use to profiteer from. Particularly if she was beautiful, if she was sought after, then uh, uh, he, and that yeah, is the son, he would barter with individuals and up the mahar, up the dowry in order to make the greatest profit from the wife of his father. And so whomsoever made the, the biggest offer, then he would marry her to him. Or thirdly, that they would prevent them from marriage completely. And that is that they would prevent them from marrying again, so that the wife would remain in the home until she died. And then when she died, they would take their inheritance. They would take all of their wealth. And so the woman may have possibly been one that was notable, one that had wealth and was, uh, 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 or had a, pay, a, a fair level of opulence. When the, when the father would pass away, they would prevent them from marrying and then uh, they, after their death, would inherit or take uh, the uh, wealth that they possessed. And so they would prevent them from marrying so as to take their inheritance. If they were to marry and move on, then of course when they passed away, that, that, would, have, that would be the wife of another man. So they would prevent them from marrying Ikhwan in order uh, to benefit from them. And so Allah Azza wa Jal established in the Quran numerous verses prohibiting those haram practices and those jahili practices. Uh, and Allah Azza wa Jal legislated for the women mirath, inheritance. يُوسِيكُمُ اللَّهُ فِي أَوْلَادِكُمْ لِلذَّكَرِ مِثْلُ حَظِّ الْأُنْثَيَيْنِ Allah Azza wa Jal mentions that indeed Allah advises you concerning your children لِذَّكَرْ for the male is the, the like of that which uh, 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 is for two females. And so they would inherit نعم, the, inherit of the, the inheritance of the male and the female were not the same but that was as our scholars have mentioned for no reason other than the fact that the males are the bread, were the breadwinners and they were the ones that were to spend from their wealth and thus Allah Azza wa Jal gave them a greater portion while the women their wealth is their wealth and it is not upon them to spend uh, uh, or to be breadwinners uh, uh, and uh, give ikhwan or spend upon their families and what have you now similarly as it relates to marriage then the forms of marriage uh, that they had in jahiliya ikhwan were many from them, there was the nikah known uh, as nikah al-istibda'. 
نكاح الاستبضاع ذكرت في حديث صحيح البخاري حديث عائشة it would occur and manifest in that a woman would have a number a large number of individuals come together in some narration some ten or so men and those men would have relations with that woman after all of them had relations with her and then she became pregnant she would choose who the father was from those ten and so it was more than likely not the father <laughs> but she would choose you as the father uh, and so he would then be considered the father of that child or we had the nikah known as nikah al-badal nikah al-badal or the uh, the nikah of exchange or substitution is that a man would approach another man and perhaps he became bored with his wife and so he would say you marry my wife and I marry yours <laughs> they would wife swap and they would be a legitimate contract and so he would marry his wife and he would marry his uh, and uh, he would start a new life with a new with the wife of his friend, the wife of his companion, and he with his wife, and it was known as nikah ul badal. Similarly, from the forms of nikah, uh, was what is known as nikah ul shigar. Nikah ul shigar is that a man would approach another man and say, "I will marry my daughter to you with the condition that you marry me to your daughter, or I'll marry my sister to you." With the condition that you marry me to your sister. And that was known as nikah al shigar and there would be no mahar. You know, because of the fact that we're doing this exchange, there would be no mahar uh, that was uh, yeah, and he agreed upon between them. Likewise, of course, ikhwan, the nikah of muta'a uh, was, was uh, prevalent among them, and that is marriage for a set period for a dowry, and they would have an agreed upon term that the marriage or whereupon the marriage would end. Uh, and Naam, it continued to be a practice into the beginnings of Islam until it was prohibited by the Messenger, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And so the prohibition then, as, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, is until Yom Al Qiyamah. But it was prohibited for a, 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 a permissible for a period of time until the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam prohibited uh, Al Muta'a. And it is only the Shia who continue to practice. Uh, the prohibited form of marriage al-mut'a and so two individuals would come together and they would say that we'll marry for six months uh, and I'll pay you a dowry of such and such and so they would live as man and wife for a six month period when the six month period was over then uh, the marriage would come to an end likewise uh, uh, we had the marriage known as nikah al-maqt nikah al-maqt is what we mentioned previously and that is that a man would marry the wife of his father. Uh, and so his father would pass away uh, and he would go on to marry the wife of his father uh, in order to keep, uh, in, oftentimes it was done in order to keep the dowry and to keep the wealth of uh, the family or the wealth that was given to that woman within the family and within the tribe. As far as their tribes were concerned, Ikhwan then, the structure of the tribe generally was that within the tribe there were three tabaqat. Within the tribe there were three levels. We had those who were known as the ahrar. The ahrar are the freedmen who are the offsprings of freedmen and have always been freedmen. And that is that they were from the pure lineage of their tribe. Uh, re returning back or being traced back to Ismail and that they were always freedmen and they were the offsprings of freedmen and so they were the Ahrar then you had the Mawali or the freed slaves and they were attributed to the tribe in that they were freed they were originally slaves and they took the tribe name Though they were not originals as far as blood is concerned. So if you were to trace them back, though they, were, uh, they received the noble name of, their tri of that tribe, they were actually freed slaves 
who were slaves of the tribe, who were freed by the tribe and remained among the tribe. And so that though they were free, they lived among them, they received the tribe name. But actually, in terms of their blood and their lineage, uh, then they were not from the tribe itself. And then we had the, uh, 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 the slaves uh, and the ariqa who were the, and continued to be the slaves of those individuals. Uh, either that they were gained because of and due to warfare, or they purchased them, or they were made slaves because of the fact that they were indebted to the tribe. And so one of the manifestations, Ikhwan, of evil among them is that riba and how it would manifest among them is that they would give a, or a loan to an individual. That person would be unable to repay the loan when it came to time for repayment. Uh, and so what they would do is that they would say that I'll give you an extension on the period of your payment with the condition that you pay an extra amount. And so if it was 100 dinar, it becomes 120. And so when the time for him to repay the 120 comes, then he was unable to pay, he would say, no problem, I'll extend your period, the period that in which you have to repay me, but your day and the day is going to go up. And so it now becomes 150. And so when the time for the repayment of the debt comes, again, he was unable to pay. And so no problem, I'll extend it to such and such a period, but it now becomes 200. And they continued in that manner until they were completely unable to pay. Because of the fact that ordinarily those who took loans were usually men who were poverty stricken. And so they struggled to make the money back in the first place. They were unable to, to make the money to repay them. And so they themselves would make an offering to them, take me as a slave. Forget about the debt, take me as a slave. And thus, the tribe would agree, rather than repaying the debt, then we would take him as a slave. Or, that individuals would come along, and they were indebted to other individuals. And so they would have an agreement with those who they had the debt with that such and such will now take you as a slave. Possibly because of the fact that they had debt with those individuals. And so they would say, for example, look, you owe me such and such. You're not able to pay me. And so now you will become the slave of such and such. And you will serve him and his family and his tribe because of your inability to pay. And that then was one of the, uh, the various forms uh, of uh, slavery that would manifest during uh, the pre-Islamic Arab. Uh, and so they, Ikhwan, would, uh, by way of uh, those various methods of slavery, they would have slaves that would serve them uh, and that would continue to serve them and perhaps were slaves uh, on the basis of these oppressive methods and these oppressive uh, uh, means of enslaving a people. And so, Ikhwan, the affair of the people of Jahiliya in terms of their aqidah was sayyid. Believing in Allah, making shirk with Allah, worshipping the idols, uh, worshipping the stars, swearing by the fathers, believing in the malaika, that which was evil, believing in the jinn, returning back to them, worshipping them, praying to them, making dua to them, and other than that. Socially, there were numerous social ills among them. That they were a people, ikhwan, who had various characteristics of sharr, as zina, riba, Zulm, oppression. The strong would overpower the weak. And they were a people, Ikhwan, who were given to these various forms of slavery. And other than that, from the forms of oppression that were manifest among them. As far as their leadership is concerned, then they thought that it was something praiseworthy that they did not used to have to be subject to leadership or submitting to leadership. That that was for the, for the weak ones, for the lowly ones. As far as us, the notables, and that was not for us. And that is not something that we are subject to and bound by. And so politically, they were a people who were given to fawdha and mayhem. Uh, and uh, were not uh, a people who would submit ikhwan to leadership 
uh, and uh, submit uh, to rule. Uh, similarly, as it relates to uh, the affairs, Ikhwan, in the mujtama, the societal affairs, the marriage among them, inheritance among them, the structure of their society, again, the strong overpowered the weak, and uh, particularly as it relates to the affairs connected to the women, then there were many manifestations uh, of dhulm as it relates to the woman, and Allah Azza wa Jal blessed the woman, Ikhwan, and gave her huquq that the people of Jahiliya never gave. That there were various rights that the people of Jahiliya never gave, Ikhwan, to the woman Allah Azza wa Jal gave uh, with the revelation of the Quran, various rights to them and made various prohibitions against the practices connected uh, to women prior to Islam. In fact, many of those practices, even the Western, even Western women were not aff afforded those rights until very recently. And so Allah Azza wa Jal with the revelation of the Quran, blessing Muhammad ibn Abdullah with that, we see Ikhwan numerous legislation uh, becoming manifest. Uh, and that no doubt was given to Muhammad ibn Abdullah, ibn Abdul Muttalib, ibn Hashim, ibn Abdul Manaf. And we're going to look Ikhwan into the affair of Abdul Muttalib, Hashim, Abdul Manaf, and the father of the messenger Abdullah. In next week's session, be it in Allah, Wallahu Ta'ala, Alam, Musallah, Wasallam, Mubarak, Alam, Nabina, Muhammad, Wa Akhir Dawana, and Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alam.